When we think of oil spills, we think of the big ones. Exxon Valdez, Deepwater Horizon. But unseen beneath the water, oil is also escaping from long-forgotten shipwrecks. Canadian waters are littered with sunken ships, which decay over time and start to leak. As Vashi Capellos explains, there are hundreds of shipwrecks across the country that could pose a problem. The ship, she's severely decayed. She's falling apart and leaking oil. It's not structurally sound. It wouldn't take very much force to collapse that hull. This is a critical situation. A sunken ship ravaged by time. The Manolis L on the verge of collapse. Oil spills out all day, every day. This is a pretty urgent matter. In my opinion, yes. January 1985, a freighter called the Manolis L passes by Change Islands, a tiny community off the northeast coast of Newfoundland. The ship was traveling at full speed en route to Quebec. Pretty good night, I must say. Not very much wind, in my recollection. The water was ice infested, but on that night in 1985, it wasn't the only thing the crew had to worry about. The ship had to stay clear of the rocky shoals that lined the underwater landscape. It didn't. We saw a flare. Must be some trouble up there somewhere. The Manolis hit a rock. The engine room began taking on water. The crew of the Manolis abandoned ship. For days, the Manolis L teetered in plain sight, perched precariously in the water. I saw them pull up on the rock, and she was on about a 45 degree angle. It was something you never saw before. I was sitting down in the rocking chair there, and I saw her move. And all of a sudden, she decided <laughs> to go. I didn't expect her to go down, you know. And, Kind of frightened me. Oh, geez, she's gone. <laughs> the sinking ship takes down with it more than 500,000 liters of fuel, most of it a highly toxic heavy oil known as Bunker C. After reports of slicks near the ship, fishermen urge the federal government to remove the oil. It doesn't happen. That decision would come back to haunt them decades later. Very nice day. This is where I fish lobsters to all around the shoreline. Larry Hurley is a commercial fisherman on Change Islands. As you can see, it gets pretty rough, right? You're heading out at the straight at the North Atlantic there. He's about to take us to the site of the Manola Cell. Right there, fair over the nose of the boat there. Now you can see a tickle there. That's back of Leo Island. About two and a half kilometers from here, west. All of this shoreline, all of this harbor air was coated right over, completely coated with this old bunker oil. Larry is recalling when oil showed up on the shoreline 28 years after the Manolis went down. It was when a storm passed through in 2013, a storm so big it further damaged the hull. Oil started spilling out. It was a kind of a frightful look because you knew what it was i mean it's oil when you see it's everything coated right over right it's a pretty bad looking scene marine and wildlife that residents say came into contact with the oil including this seal didn't survive those ducks are by the hundreds you know wild birds they're up on the rocks perishing and the ministry responsible for these cleanups, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, or DFO, decided to leave the oil underwater. Instead, the Coast Guard, overseen by DFO, repaired whatever hull damage it could, and then installed a metal device called a cofferdam 
to catch the oil from an unfixable breach, but oil was still spilling out. Nevertheless, the ministry has called these measures effective. When we're told those cofferdams are, quote, effective, would you disagree? I would disagree. Why? I've seen ROV footage showing a cofferdam, and two or three feet away from the uh, cofferdam, there's oil leaking out. They're not very effective. Definitely not a permanent solution in your view. No, I think it's beyond the uh, scope right now of being a temporary solution. DFO has since redesigned the cofferdam to prevent oil from coming out. But naval architect Kevin Strobridge says leaks can and will happen again. He spent more than a year assessing the risk posed by the Manolis. The steel is degrading. It's, it's already uh, to the point where it's 88% decayed in some areas. The seriousness comes from the potential impacts because she's so close to the shoreline, any oil spill in that area is gonna have catastrophic effects on the environment. Here's the hull of the ship. You'll see that the oil just kind of stretches out, almost like taffy. That oil is very, very thick, and if it gets onto the shoreline, it sticks to the rocks, or it sticks to the shoreline, it sticks to the marine animals. Now, this is supposed to be perfectly flat. If this was a, a, a new ship, this would all be flat, and you can see all the all the bumps and rough edges and the cracks. It's coming apart, almost literally at the seams. Steel can be similar to a piece of paper in how it reacts. This is a piece of uh, paper, no cracks in it, so it's pretty resilient. If you put a little crack in this, and put the same amount of force on it, crack propagation. So that's exactly how the steel is, yep. is acting in the hull. That's exactly what you're seeing. Oil spills come in two forms, chronic or catastrophic. Experts say the Manolis has the potential to be both. Catastrophic spills are easiest to see. Exxon Valdez, Deepwater Horizon, very visible. The damage, almost instant. Chronic spills are small amounts of oil released over a long time. People should be very worried about chronic. Chronic spills are harder to detect, but experts like seabird ecologist Ian Jones argue those chronic spills can be just as harmful. These chronic oil spills, in fact, because they're, they're spread out over time, they're potentially endangering more wildlife than would be endangered by a single event. People are not so concerned about it. And people are more concerned almost about litter along the side of the highway, because they notice that, than they are maybe about thousands or hundreds of thousands of seabirds dying out, out at sea that they can't see. Right now, the Canadian government has no concrete plan to permanently remove the oil. So the environmental threat still looms underwater. We got pristine Atlantic Ocean water. If that oil comes down there, and uh, in, in especially in a fishing season, we're, we're doomed. It's a threat to us. It's a threat to, to everything here in this community and everything that this community is based on. It's, it's as simple as that. Next, who should clean up Canada's slow and steady oil spills? So what would your advice be to the new government on this file? To spend the money now before they become an environmental hazard. It's incredible how much history still exists. There's a lot of stuff that's been lost on the bottom of the lake. Tom Kowalsik is a ship hunter. Lake Erie, his hunting ground. Best day I had was three shipwrecks in one day. You just never know. Over the summer, Tom was scouting an area near Marblehead, Ohio, about an hour west of Cleveland. It was late in the afternoon. I'd been out since early morning. I was going to call it a day. But just as he was about to head in... I looked over and up pops a target. He found something. It became obvious that it was a, a uh, barge that looked very much like an oil tanker. It was the Argo right, right from the start. The Argo, 
the 120-foot barge disappeared after a storm on Lake Erie. It was missing for almost 80 years. It surprised me because it wasn't really expecting to see anything there. But Tom found more than just another ship. When it went down, the Argo was believed to be carrying close to a million liters of fuel. While they were out there, they smelled a strong solvent smell and believed something may be leaking from the Argo. Tom warned the U.S. Coast Guard right away. We immediately responded with the small boat and pollution responders. We take the threat very seriously. Within weeks, a salvage operation to remove the oil was underway. Several weeks later, that threat was gone. The Argo isn't an isolated case. There are thousands of shipwrecks under the world's oceans. Many from World War II holding billions of liters of oil. And those ships are deteriorating, about to meet the same fate as the Manolis L in Newfoundland. A decades-old shipwreck that is slowly but surely leaking oil. The U.S. is doing something about these underwater problems. In 2010, the U.S. government spent a million dollars to find these problem ships. Of 20,000 shipwrecks, 87 were identified as priority vessels, including the Argo. While the U.S. has spent time and money to identify these problem vessels, the Canadian government has done no such thing. Ottawa doesn't even keep track of shipwrecks, let alone determine the potential environmental risks they pose. Dionysus Rossi is a maritime lawyer. We simply don't know what we're dealing with because there isn't enough information. Do you think that's a problem? I do. Each of those vessels could constitute a potential environmental hazard. It certainly is an issue that needs to be addressed. So there could be a number of ships leaking oil or a number of environmental hazards we just don't know about. Absolutely. 16 by 9 analyzed shipwreck data from the beginning of the 20th century. Here's what we found. Of the thousands of ships that have sunk over the last hundred years, we identified more than 700 possible at-risk vessels in Canadian waters. It is incumbent upon the Government of Canada to ascertain the location of those vessels, to make sure that the hulls of those vessels and the fuel tanks are intact and that they don't cause a, a risk to environmental uh, uh, areas of Canada. If they don't do that? Then they will have to live with the consequences of remediation afterwards. And the consequences of remediating a vessel can be quite costly. So then who pays? In most cases, the Canadian government has paid. So the taxpayer? The taxpayer has paid, that's correct. In just the last three years, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, or DFO, has spent close to 30 million taxpayer dollars on cleaning up spills from historical shipwrecks. Ships like the SS Arrow off the coast of Nova Scotia, the MG Zelinsky off the coast of BC, and now the Manolis L in Newfoundland. These are just three examples. Here's how the taxpayer can end up on the hook if a historical shipwreck begins leaking oil. It's the ship owner's responsibility to cover the cost of the cleanup. If the ship owner is unable to pay and the insurance runs out, there's more money available in industry funds like Canada's Ship Source Oil Pollution Fund, or SOPF. There's a problem though. SOPF claims have to be made within five years. There are instances, for example, when a ship would have sunk 50 years ago and therefore would not be eligible. That's correct. If you've got a historical wreck that is decades old, you would not be able to survive the five-year limitation period. That means if oil starts leaking from a shipwreck after five years, the ship industry doesn't pay, we do. We tried getting answers from the fisheries minister multiple times, but our interview requests were denied. We even went to the prime minister's office, but got nowhere. No one from the federal government was willing to publicly address the threat under our waters. So what would your advice be to the new government on this file? To not be penny wise and pound foolish to spend the money now to adopt a proactive approach to deal with the issue of wrecks before they become an environmental hazard.
While the federal government continues to make excuses, Newfoundland residents wait anxiously. They've already seen firsthand the devastation a small spill from the Manolis can cause. The big one, they hope to never find out. It needs to be cleaned up. Simple plain as that, but it needs to be cleaned up. They're playing with our livelihoods and it's not a good thing. It should be removed. Next week on 16 by 9, he scammed billions of dollars in one of the biggest Ponzi schemes the world has ever seen. But was a major Canadian bank helping him get away with it? Is it fun being a billionaire? Yes. <laughs> yes. It was like books of fancy pictures and data. It was very, very, very believable. Hello, everyone. The first half of 2000... I don't like that. Let's go back. None of it was true. His was a classic Ponzi scheme. An indictment charging R. Allen Stanford. There will be some criminal charges brought. In that regime, people didn't ask questions. Nobody asked questions. Over $12 billion were invested. The core capital loss to the investors is $5.5 billion. The majority of the money went through TD. They're vouching for his legitimacy. We hope you'll join us for that story next week on 16 by 9. In the meantime, that is our broadcast for tonight. A reminder, you can always connect with us on Facebook and Twitter or at globalnews.ca slash 16 by 9. I'm Carolyn Jarvis. From all of us here at 16 by 9, thanks for watching.